So hi everybody, uh, thanks very much for uh, having me. Uh, I'm sorry I can't be there in person, uh, but uh, Teague uh, very kindly said that uh, an alternative was to, we could do it this way, that I could give a, a presentation online. Uh, the initial idea was we were going to do this by Skype, but uh, I, I don't really trust the uh, technology to work. Uh, besides, we have all the facilities here to record stuff like this and, you know, package it up and bring in the PowerPoints and that kind of thing. So that's what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to record this in, in various segments, so uh, it'll be broken up. Uh, and uh, hopefully it'll be, um, uh, uh, it'll be an interesting way of, uh, of listening to someone give the talk. And then afterwards I will be live uh, by Skype to do uh, the Q&A. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today uh, is the problem of radical skepticism. Now this is... For me, philosophically speaking, it's my, both my first love and my true love. It's what got me into philosophy, and it's a problem that I keep coming back to. Uh, it's also the topic of my new book, which is coming out uh, at the end of this year, I think, uh, which has the same title as, as my talk, Epistemic Angst. What I'm interested in in particular, or what I'm going to focus on, is the Cartesian sceptical problem. So the problem to do concern with uh, whether we have widespread knowledge of a, a world that's external to us. And I'm going to try and do something which may be foolhardy. I'm going to try and summarise uh, the main line that I take on radical scepticism in my book. Um, it, like I say, this may be foolhardy. The book is obviously it's a very long book, uh, whereas this talk is I'm going to try and cram it into 45 minutes. But uh, I figured this way, you know, you, you get to hear the positive proposal, and I don't have to simplify a bunch of things. But on the other hand. Uh, you get a kind of a, a bigger picture presented to you than you, you'd normally get in a, in, a, in a paper. A few preliminaries, things that I'm going to be uh, focusing upon. I'm just going to cut to the chase and talk about rationally grounded knowledge. And I'm not going to defend that. In the book, I defend that. I think when we talk about radical scepticism, that's specifically what we have in mind. It's rationally grounded knowledge. That's what's at issue. I'm going to be interested in scepticism qua paradox. So... That's, I think that's quite important to understanding of the sceptical problem, that it isn't a position, or in its strongest form anyway, it isn't a position. It is rather a paradox, right? It's a set of claims which we're antecedently committed to, which seem to naturally arise out of our ordinary folk epistemic concepts and which generate a contradiction. So it's kind of the problem is internal to us in our own conceptual scheme. And I'm just going to talk about the, 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 the stock hypothesis I'm going to use when I talk about this is going to be brains in fans. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Plug your radical sceptical hypothesis of choice in there. I just need something that makes vivid the possibility of widespread error. And I'm going to put that in tension with what I'm going to call an E or an everyday type proposition. The kind of proposition, everyday proposition, which we do know, but which we couldn't know if uh, we were brains in fans, which are inconsistent with the brain of our hypothesis. Here's the structure of the paper. Um, I'm going to be talking about two versions of the sceptical problem in the contemporary literature. Uh, I'm going to talk about two epistemic principles, closure and determination, on which they, these formulations of scepticism turn. And then I'm going to be saying that these, and this is the key move, I'm going to be saying that these formulations of scepticism, although superficially they look very similar, it looks like nothing much hangs upon which formulation you go for. I want to suggest that actually they're logically distinct. They're logically distinct in, in dialectically important ways such that we shouldn't expect that an answer to the one sceptical problem is thereby an answer to the other sceptical problem. And I'm, I'm then going to be suggesting that what we need, where we've gone wrong, essentially, when we're in our dealings with scepticism, is to fail to realise that really we've got two problems here which require two solutions. And then I'm going to just cut to the chase and give you what I think those two solutions are. One has its source in Wittgenstein's remarks and uncertainty on the structure of rational evaluation. The other has its, is, is what I call epistemological disjunctivism, which is a view you find in McDowell, which I've developed in my own particular way. And then I'm going to be saying that these two anti-skeptical proposals, they look like competing proposals, but in fact they're not. I think they're complementary. Uh, and indeed, it, it looks like they're offering very different diagnosis skepticism, but I think properly understood. The, the Wittgensteinian response to skepticism is dealing with one sceptical problem and, and epistemological structuralism is dealing with the other. And that when you put them together, you get a unified treatment of the problem. I call this a, a bioscopic response to skepticism. It's, it's an ugly phrase. I was hoping 
to come up with something better, but it, it never arose. Um, it, it says exactly what I want to say, the last thing, although it's ugly. This is idea that we've sort of been seeing things, you know, through one eye, but now we get to see things properly through both eyes. Okay, there's the first section. Okay, now the first formulation of radical skepticism. I think this, many of you will be familiar with this. Uh, it's what's closure-based formulation. It turns on a closure principle. So we have it here on the PowerPoint. First claim is that one cannot have rationally grounded knowledge that one is not a brain of atoms. More generally, one can't have rationally grounded knowledge of the denials of skeptical hypotheses. And I take this to be a claim that's widely held. There seems to be something inherently epistemically modest in the idea that one could know such a thing, particularly given that we're talking about rationally grounded knowledge, remember. You know, what reason do I possibly have for thinking that I'm not uh, uh, a brain of that right now? And then we have the third claim, which is the, the, the sceptical claim, so the anti-sceptical claim rather, which is that one does have lots of rationally grounded knowledge of everyday proposition. And so now the question becomes, how is the first claim meant to be in conflict with the second, with the third? And the answer to that is that we need some sort of some bridging claim. And that's what we have here. So right now it's just a bridging claim. If you can't have rational grand knowledge of the answer to hypotheses, which is the BIV hypothesis, then you can't have rational grand knowledge of E type propositions either. And the question becomes, well, what motivates that bridging claim? And the answer is meant to be the closure principle. Before I get to that, though, let me just make one remark about the way I formulate a sceptical problem here. I've actually formulated it stronger than I need, or the sceptic needs anyway. I've said that one cannot have uh, rationally grounded knowledge of the denial of sceptical hypotheses, but of course that's, as long as that one doesn't, that would be sufficient. You don't need to modalise it. But I think it's, it's more useful, even though uh, it's not it's unnecessary, but I think it's more useful to, to, to modalise the claim, because that's closer in spirit, I think, to what the sceptic's actually saying. I mean, what they're saying is that it's not an incidental act on our part, that we don't know these things. I and mean, this is part of the very nature of our epistemic predicament that we can't know these things. And notice these three claims collectively, they generate a contradiction, right? So one of them has to be false. We know that in advance. Uh, so we're not arguing to a conclusion here where there's an option of uh, endorsing the conclusion. Rather, we've got three claims, one of which has to go. So the skeptical horn of the trilemma, as it were, would be to reject the third. That would be skepticism quiet position. The skepticism quiet paradox doesn't take any stand on this. It just says, look, you're committed to all these three claims, but they can't all be true. OK, so what motivates that second claim? Because it's not obvious as it stands. And the standard line is that some sort of closure principle is in play. Now, I'm going to formulate closure in a very specific way. Closure gets understood in lots of different ways in the literature. Uh, and some of them, I think, may be quite dubious. But the one I want to defend is quite specific, and it's this that if you've got rationally grounded knowledge and that you make a competent deduction on that basis and thereby form a belief in the entailed proposition, and whilst retaining your knowledge of the antecedent throughout, then what results must be, what results from that competent deduction must be itself rationally grounded knowledge. And the rationale for this is just, look, competent deduction is a paradigm instance of a rational process. So if what's going into the competent deduction is rationally grounded knowledge and nothing is you know, there's no extraneous facts here. It's not you're, you're losing your rational ground knowledge of the antecedent through the, through the deduction or anything like that. And if you really are basing your belief on the competent deduction from rational ground knowledge, then it, it just would be mysterious that what results is not itself rationally grounded knowledge. As I say, there are different, there are weaker formulations of closure in the literature. Some of them, I think, may be problematic in various ways, but I think it's hard to see what's problematic about this formulation. But it's also clear that once you've got that formulation in mind, it's quite straightforward to generate the second premise. You know, after all, if you did have knowledge of the E-type propositions, then through competent deductions, you could come to have rationally great knowledge of the denials of skeptical hypotheses. So if you can't have knowledge of the denials of skeptical hypotheses, it follows that you can't have knowledge of the E-type propositions either. Hence, we've got our paradox, right? So the, the paradox, in essence, is, I, mean, I think, properly formulated. is isn't quite what I had before. You know, those two claims plus the second bridging claim, it's this. We've got an inconsistent triad. The first horn is that uh, we can't understand the sceptical hypotheses. The second horn is the closure principle, and the th so as I've understood it. And the third claim is that we've got widespread rationally grounded knowledge. All three of those can't be right, so something has to go. The question becomes which. Okay, so that's closure-based scepticism. 
And I want to talk about, about a different kind of scepticism, which is closely related. Often these two formulations actually get run together. This is what's known as undetermination based scepticism. So here's the formulation. So the first claim is one cannot have uh, a rational basis which favours one's belief in the E-type proposition over the, the brain of that scenario. So I kind of have better reason for thinking that I'm sitting here now than that I'm a brain of that who, uh, you know, float of that nutrient who merely thinks that he's sitting here now, right? And the thought is that there is no such reason in existence that could play that role. So the first claim seems, seems right, seems rooted in order and understanding what it is to have rational support that favours one scenario over another. And then the idea is this comes into conflict with the anti-skeptical claim, the third claim, which is the same as before, that one does have widespread rationally grounded knowledge. And now the challenge becomes, well, how do we get the conflict between the two? Well, we need a bridging claim. So as before, a straightforward bridging claim, which just says, look, you know, given the first claim, the third claim must be false. And so we've got ourselves a paradox. We've got ourselves an inconsistent triad. Something has to go. Um, so as before as well, I've put this, I've modalized the claim, the first claim there, it's cannot rather than does not, does not would do, but I think that's more accurate to do it that way. Um, and then the other thing, just as last time, the weak spot here seems to be the bridging claim, right? If this is meant to be a paradox, one well, might question where does where does support for the bridging claim come from? It doesn't look obvious at all. But this is where, just like last time, we now appeal to an epistemic principle, which does look very plausible. And this is the undetermination principle. And this says, it's on the PowerPoint, if you know that P and Q describe incompatible scenarios, and yet you lack a rational basis that favours belief in P over Q, then you lack rational ground knowledge of P. I mean, I think you can see the plausibility of this by considering the extreme case. The extreme case would be P and not P. So imagine you take yourself to have no better reason for believing, for favouring uh, P over not P. Well, then in what sense can you have rationally grounded knowledge uh, the P, right? I mean, that would just be odd. You know, I, I, I have to myself to have no reason to think that I'm sitting down and that I'm standing up. But yet I do take myself to have rational ground knowledge that I'm sitting down. That seems very strange. But of course, once one grants that, and then now all we have to do is, is move to, we've gone from obvious incompatibility, now we move to ones that are just nearly known, obvious or otherwise, and we've got ourselves the determination principle. With this principle in play, though, you can motivate that second claim, right? Because the thought is, well, look, if you really do lack a rational basis, it favours your everyday beliefs over a sceptical alternative, well, then it follows that you can't have rational ground knowledge of those, of those everyday propositions. Right? So as before, this, this, the sceptical paradox properly formulated is, is, is like this. It's an inconsistent triad. On the one hand, that you can't have rational basis that favours everyday scenarios over sceptical scenarios, the determination principle, and that one does have lots of rationally grounded knowledge. The thought is you can't have all three. Something has to go. So skepticism as a position would be the, to, to reject the third. But skepticism as a paradox takes no standards. It just says, look, you're committed to all three, but you can't have all three. So how do you explain that? So I noted earlier that the, the two arguments, they look superficially very similar. In fact, they include claims that are superficially similar, and they are... They, you know, insofar as they motivate skepticism's position, it's the same skeptical conclusion. Uh, and the standard view, actually, in the literature is that either they are equivalent, uh, or if, as far as they're not equivalent, this is Cohen's view, it, it, it doesn't really matter, it sort of dialectically cancels out. So Bruckner's view is that they're basically equivalent, and Cohen's view is that they're, they're not equivalent, but it sort of cancels out. But my view, and this is something I've argued more than a decade ago, was that now that they are substantially different and uh, in important ways, I think we can see that by simplifying what the relevant entailment is in each case. And I've done this here on the PowerPoint. So the closure-based entailment, I think, is pretty straightforward. I mean, what's at issue is that it's, it's so far as you've got a rationally grounded knowledge of the E-type proposition, you know, that I'm sitting down, let's say. The, the worry is that that generates via closure inference that one's got a rationally grounded knowledge that you're not a brain of that. But that's actually significantly stronger than what you get the relevant analogous uh, entailment in the undetermination case. Now, I've had to contrapose undetermination to, to get it this form, but I've done it that way just so you get a common antecedent across the two simplified entailments. So this is what you get. If S has rationally grounded knowledge of the E-type proposition, then S has rational support for a belief that E, which favours that belief over the sceptical alternative, brain of S, or what have you. Now, I think you can see that that's 
that's actually significantly weaker. The first, look at the common antecedents. Consequent to the, the first internment, though, is not, rationally grounded knowledge that you're not a brain fan. For the undetermination internment, though, all you get is that the rational support which favours the everyday scenario of a sceptical scenario. But, I mean, forget about the sceptical scenario. It should be clear you can have evidence that favours one scenario over another without thereby having rationally grounded knowledge of the denial of a second scenario, in this case, a sceptical scenario. So what I'm suggesting is, uh, is that the, uh, the closure-based entailment is, is logically stronger in the sense that from, this, uh, from a common antecedent, it generates a consequent which entails, but which is not entailed by, the consequence of the other termination-based entailment. Now, the mere fact that there's this logical difference in itself might not have any dialectical significance. It might be. Uh, you know, if you thought that undetermination was the the, the intermination principle had to be rejected, then that might give you a reason to think that closure, therefore, must be rejected because it's even more demanding. Right? But actually, I think what this reveals is, uh, and I won't go into all the details of this, I, I talk about this a lot more in the book. I think what it reveals when you go through all the, the dialectical possibilities here is that at the very least the issue is far more complicated than we might have hitherto supposed. And it opens up an intriguing possibility, which I think is the correct interpretation, actually that these uh, sceptical arguments, which trade on distinct sceptical sources, distinct sources of scepticism. Now I'm going to cut to the chase and tell you what I think those are. So I'm going to cut out all the, all the, all, all the scene setting, all the, the steps that go in the book which connect this discussion to, to the sources of scepticism discussion. Um, but bear with me. Hopefully I can still convince you nonetheless. So I think there are, there are two sources of scepticism going on here. The first is what I call, uh, it's a claim about the universality of rational evaluation. I think this is what's underlying the, the closure-based uh, sceptical argument. Because think about what's going on there. The thing, what's disturbing about closure is that we seem to be able to go from very localised, rational evaluation, everyday rational evaluations, which are completely localised, like sort of rational evaluations might make if you're trying to decide, you know, uh, where your car is parked or something like that, where you're taking into account a very limited range of considerations and so forth. But through these closure inferences, it seems perfectly benign to then start undertaking uh, like what we might call fully general rational evaluation, because that's what we're doing in effect when we start to think about sceptical hypotheses. We're starting to rationally evaluate our beliefs as a whole. And it's that transition that I think is really troublesome in the closure-based uh, argument. And I think... The idea that that transition is benign is what I'm calling the universality of rational evaluation. It's this idea that we can extend the scope of rational evaluations and that there is no principal constraint on this. You know, they, can go as, they can go as global as you like. Now, of course, there are also practical constraints on rational evaluation. No one would deny that. You know, intelligence, creativity, time, and so forth. But that's not what I'm getting at. I'm saying it, the question is, are there any in principle constraints? And I think, on the face of it, you might think, well, no, there are any practical but I think that, that source of skepticism, that's what's driving the closure-based skeptical argument. And I think that is a, an, an interesting philosophical thesis in its own right, which we, we need to examine. The second claim, which I think is the one that underlies um, uh, undetermination-based skepticism, is what I'm going to call the insularity of reason. So this is the thought that uh, uh, the rational support that we have for our beliefs, even in the very best case, so I'm talking about beliefs external world beliefs, empirical beliefs, that rational support can never, is always compatible with the possibility of widespread error in our beliefs. And that's what I mean by the, the rational support being essentially insular. You know, our rational support can never, for example, be factored. I mean, that's ruled out directly. I think that undetermination uh, underpins undetermination-based skepticism, because w without that claim, you're not going to get undetermination-based skepticism up and running. And, and indeed, I grant, it, it can on the face of it seem like a very obvious claim. I mean, isn't that just the nature of rational support that it has that feature? But again, I also want to suggest that this is a, a, a philosophical thesis. And I think when we start to examine it, we start to realise that there's something quite dubious about it. OK, so what I've done uh, in these, these sections so far, I've given you these two sceptical arguments. I've told you how they trade on distinct principles and how they're logically distinct. And I've I've mooted the point that I think there are the, these distinct sources of skepticism too. And before I move on to start talking about the positive proposal, 
I just want to say something about what we might call the, the anti-skeptical desire driven answer. What, what sort of features would we want uh, a response to radical skepticism to have? And I think, well, look, given that we've granted that there are in principle these two distinct skeptical problems here, I think we need uh, a response to skepticism which deals with both. And obviously that response needs to be um, integrated and mutually supporting, right? I mean, if they're in conflict with each other, then that's no good, right? If you have a response to one problem, a response to the other, but they, they don't fit then that, that's clearly a difficulty. Moreover, I think what we should be looking for is what I'm going to call uh, an undercutting response to radical skepticism. And what I mean by that is um, we can think of anti-skeptical responses as being either undercutting or overriding. So if we have, we're faced with a putative paradox. We're faced with something that looks very much like a paradox. Uh, and then the question becomes, well, is it a genuine paradox? Right? I mean, is there a genuine conflict in our ordinary ways of thinking about this subject matter. If it is a genuine paradox, then in a nice little phrase that Stephen Schiffer had a few years back uh, talking about skepticism, he says about paradoxes, genuine paradoxes, is that there are no happy face solutions. And I think that, that that's a really important truth. Right? Once you grant that it's a genuine paradox, then the only way you can respond is by getting rid of something which actually has an intuitive pull. Now that's not to say that that isn't a good way to deal with paradoxes. Maybe that's the, it could be the only way to deal with them. It's what I'm call, here calling overriding response. So there is, there is a genuine obstacle to knowing here. It's just that we, we find some way of overcoming it. But there's always something, I think, inherently intellectually dissatisfying about overriding response. Far more satisfying is if you can get an undercutting response to a paradox, in this case, radical skepticism. And what an undercutting response does, it says, well, it looks like a paradox isn't really a paradox at all. There's some trickery going on. Some, some philosophy or some theory is being smuggled in here as common sense. And once we see that, move it, then we can, our ordinary ways of thinking, find that there, there was no genuine paradox. That's what I think we should seek, and indeed, what I'm suggesting, the bioscopic response that I'm going to offer has all these features. It deals with both sceptical problems separately, but in a way that uh, they're mutually supportive and integrated, compatible with one another, and it's also undercutting. That's the bioscopic response skills. Okay, so now I want to talk about uh, Wittgenstein on the, the structure of rational evaluation. I say the structure of reasons here, that's just because I couldn't fit it on the PowerPoint. I mean the structure of rational evaluation. And I have in mind Wittgenstein's final notebooks, uh, which were published as Uncertainty. So these are four notebooks. They consist of um, remarks that were unedited by him. Very fragmentary, you know, very Wittgensteinian. He's jumping backwards and forwards, different ideas. I mean, I think as historical documents that they're fascinating, actually. Um, uh, you know, they, they take us up to a few days before he dies, and you get these poignant little autobiographical notes. You know, at one point he says like, something like, uh, "I don't think I'll, uh, I don't, I can't seem to get to the beginning of this. And I, don't, I don't suppose they will know." But there's a certain, I think there's a distinct, something distinctive going on in uncertainty. There's a distinctive thread of thought, um, and I, I, I'm, oh, I won't be putting much stock in this today. Uh, I actually think it's it's new. I don't think you find it in earlier Wittgenstein work, I actually think that it's in, he gets it from John Henry Newman actually, and Newman's masterpiece an essay in Aid of the Grand Reset, but I, I won't be going into that today either. Uh, if anyone wants to talk about like, the q and I'd love to, because it's one of my, um, it's one of my pet side projects, try and show that Wittgenstein is, is a, a Newmanite. Here's the core idea that Wittgenstein's advancing, or so I claim anyway. I think he's, he has this conception of the structure of rational evaluation as having a certain basic structure which is uh, distinctive and, and completely different to what anyone hitherto has supposed by Newman. Um, he wants to say that all rational evaluation takes place relative to these common sense or sometimes called more uncertainties, these hinge commitments he puts them at one point, and that these hinge commitments are thereby completely immune to rational evaluation. And by this is, put, this is both positive and negative rational evaluation. You can't rationally doubt them, but you can't rationally believe them either, right? And then the conclusion, that's right, and the conclusion of this is that it's in the very nature of rational evaluation that it be essentially local. The very idea of fully general rational evaluations makes no sense. And I think this is, Wittgenstein definitely wants to, us to disabuse ourselves of that idea. So he's going head to head with this idea that we encapsulated earlier as the universality of rational evaluations. That's clearly what Wittgenstein wants to reject. He needs something very genius for him. 
He thinks that these hinge commitments are they're animal, they're visceral. They don't, they're not acquired via uh, rational processes. They're not responsive, not directly responsive. Not, or if there's time, I'll explain what I mean by that qualified direct, directly. Not directly responsive to rational considerations. They're not optional. It's not up to you whether you hold them or not. Um, there are a bunch of exegetical issues, which would be fun to get into about uncertainty, which I'm not going to get into today. I mean, like I say, I think the real stimulus of the book is more, is more Newman than more. Um, I also have a line, I think, in the first notebook, which takes up to about section 65, probably misleads us a little bit as to what Wittgenstein is about, because I think the section of 65 is really about more, it is about more, and it's about more on idealism, you know, proof of an external world. And... And there the focus is on claims that simply may have no content, claims like there are physical objects, there is an external world. But I think really what he's more interested in, and that's the, the next three notebooks, is the more uncertainties, or you could, I you just much say the Newman certainties, actually, because Newman has cases just like this, these everyday certainties, not these physical philosophical claims that he thinks are contentless, but claims that could have a content. Uh, I mean, this is me talking now, right? Uh, claims that could have a content but which we can make no sense of being subject to rational evaluations. Right, so it, the, the thought is it becomes a surprise to us that they play this special role. Now Moore has something, cling, has something like this idea going on. So Moore's idea was that these everyday certainties, these more uncertainties, they could play a special dialectical role. They give us, as it were, a point at which we can push back against a skeptical or philosophical objection. And so they have a kind of quasi-foundational role. They have a special epistemic status, if you like. But Wittgenstein's thought is that, no, no, in virtue of them having this, 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 this certainty that attaches to them, they can play no epistemic role at all. Certainly not when it comes to rational evaluations. Rather, they are what has to stand fast in order for there to be rational evaluations. OK, let me give you some quotations to talk through this. Um, I mean, given that they're fragmentary notebooks, the, the, there isn't an argument. You know, there's no point as Wittgenstein's state in argument. Uh, we can reconstruct something. Um, and I think it's quite compelling when you put, put it all together. But it's not going to be a series of deductive steps. Uh, rather, I think he gives us a, a series of examples, and he kind of teases us into seeing the oddity of how we're thinking about these issues. So think of this, these passages here. My having two hands is in normal circumstances as certain as anything that I could produce an evidence for it. That is why I'm not in a position to excite my hands as evidence for it. If a blind man were to ask me if he got two hands, I should not make sure by looking. If I were to have any doubt of it, then I don't know why I should trust my eyes. Why should I test my eyes by looking to find out whether I see my two hands? What is to be tested by what? Here you've got the very essence of the idea, right? I mean, first we have to see the oddity of thinking that your your hands as, as, as granted in reasons. You know, imagine someone's asking you if you've got two hands, someone's blind, let's say. And the idea that you go, you know, go, oh. Yes, there they are. Yes, I do. I mean, there's something deeply odd about that. And it's not just because they're proprioceptive sense. It's because this is like a sort of bedrock certainty for us. But Wittgenstein's trying, what he's trying to do is get us to see, well, look, the oddity of thinking of these, of these basic commitments, these things we're most certain of, as being, as being rationally grounded and, and, and as being subject to rational doubt. Because, of course, everything is called to question if I don't, if I, if I don't have hands, right, in normal circumstances. That, that those two positive and negative claims, that they go together. Insofar as we can make no sense of rational doubt of that of which we're most certain of, by the same time we can make no sense of being rationally grounded on either. Right, so contra the sort of Morian idea that we're meant to extract a sort of general anti-skeptical moral from this. No, no. The thought is that uh, fully general rational evaluations, whether negative, i.e. sceptical, or positive, you know, sort of classical foundationalist, Cartesian, Morin, what have you, neither makes any sense. Right? Once we recognise that these basic commitments we have have this optimal certainty attached to them, such that we evaluate other things relative to them, then we realise that they can't be the sorts of things which are themselves subject to rational evaluation. So again, some more quotations. If you try to doubt everything, you will not get as far as doubting anything. The game of doubt in itself presupposes certainty. Right? So you try and doubt the hinge your hinge commitments, your basic commitments, your more uncertainties, uh, you're, you're trying to do the impossible. And it, he would say as well, by the way, that the game of believing presupposes certainty. Right? This is the point about it, this, it being double-edged. I think a lot of people take, they get what Wittgenstein's saying about doubt. They don't get the, the, you know, the, 
the, the other the other side of the coin of this, which is Wittgenstein thinks this applies to belief, to uh, rational commitments all. And then a very famous quotation. It's where we get the hinge metaphor from. He says, the questions that we raise in our doubts depend upon the fact that some propositions are exempt from doubt, are, are as it were like hinges on which those turn. That is to say, it belongs to the logic of our scientific investigations that certain things are indeed not doubted. But it isn't in situations like this, we just can't investigate everything, for that reason we are forced to rest content with assumption. If I want the door to turn, the hinges must stay put. A few things to say about this hinge metaphor. I'm going to use the hinge metaphor. I think the, the way Vic, Wittgenstein has in mind here is just the idea of something standing fast so that something else can turn. But there is an inherent danger with the hinge metaphor, and I think it's, it's misled a few commentators, because you can think of hinges also as being optional, right? You can move them around. So you, if you move a hinge around on a door, then the door will open in a different way. But that's not the aspect of the metaphor that Wittgenstein has in mind. I mean, as, as I said before, he thinks of animal, visceral, non-optional. They're not things that one can move at will. But as long as we bear that in mind, I think the metaphor is, is harmless. Another thing, people talk about hinge propositions. I'm going to talk about hinge commitments. The, the problem with talking about hinge propositions is it puts our focus on the, the particular content. Whereas really what we're interested in is the, is the distinctive propositional attitude that we have to that content. So that's why I think it's best to go for the, talk about the commitments rather than the proposition. Um, this point that Wittgenstein makes here about, uh, about logic, I think, is, is really important. He makes this again and again. It's very tempting to think that Wittgenstein's point is like it's merely a psychological point. It's that somehow psychologically we can't doubt these things, and therefore we should reject skepticism. I mean, that, there is a, a reading of Wittgenstein like this. It's the Strawson, sometimes called the human or the naturalistic reading of Wittgenstein. But I think that's, a, that's not what he wants. I mean, I think he does think that. But I think this is, it, it doesn't carry any anti-skeptical weight for him. This is rather a stepping stone towards a more substantive claim, which is this logical point. I mean, I think he wants to say, look, the very idea of fully general rational valuations is simply incoherent. So it's not as if, you know, if only we were cleverer or, you know, we'd have... A, 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 created a different way of doing rational evaluations, then you know, it could have been otherwise. It could not have been otherwise. It just simply makes no sense. And I think that's very important because, you know, it's not, I mean, Barry Stroud in his wonderful book, The Significance of Philosophical Skepticism, he highlighted how, one of his great innovations of that book, I think, was to highlight how it's not enough just to show that ordinary practices are very different from skeptical practices. Because the skeptic can come back to that and say, well, yeah, but... Uh, Skeptical practices are purified versions of ordinary practices, right? So they're like our ordinary practices if we followed through them consistently. So that the skeptic can say that can grant they're distinct, but nonetheless argue that they're rooted in our ordinary practices. So I think this is a kind of objection uh, that a Stroud type person could make to certain ordinary language responses to skepticism. But he doesn't work on Wittgenstein. Because Wittgenstein is saying, no, no, these skeptical philosophical rational evaluations we're trying to undertake here. They're not purified versions of our everyday episteme practices. Uh, there's a difference of kind or degree here, and what's been attempted is actually something that's deeply, deeply inconsistent. So that's the basic outline of Wittgenstein's proposal, this, this claim about the structure of rational evaluation. The problem with developing this view has always been trying to find a way of spelling out the details such that the view doesn't collapse, for example, doesn't collapse into a form of skepticism itself. It can look that way, viewed, you know, so... You know, if you just when you might think, well, so the, the very our most basic commitments, our most basic certainties are immune to rational evaluation, can sound like skepticism in another guise. Right? I think there's one way of making the problem here vivid, um, which is uh, what I, in terms of what I call the closure problem. It's a problem that certainly Wittgenstein is aware of. So let me consider this passage here. It is certain that after the Battle of Austerlitz, Napoleon, well, in that case, it's surely also certain the Earth existed. What Wittgenstein is getting at here is that, look, we have, the thought is that we've got these ordinary commitments, and the thought is that they're, they're rationally grounded in a localised way, but that's okay. But that these everyday commitments sort of presuppose these hinge commitments, which are themselves immune to rational evaluation. And the idea is, the thought is, how stable is that picture, right? Because, you know, in, in particular, how bona fide is the rational standing that the, the local beliefs are? And you can bring out worries about that rational standing by thinking about the logical relationships between the everyday beliefs and the hinge commitments. And this is what's going on here. So I take it, uh, what Wittgenstein has in mind here is this sort of Russellian sceptical hypothesis that the, 
the universe came into existence a few moments ago, replete with the traces of a distant ancestry. That's how he puts it. So we can imagine a historian making a, a, a very specific and concrete historical claim based on very specific and concrete historical evidence. So he says the Battle of Austerlitz happened in 18 blah blah blah. And then you can imagine someone saying, well, of course, that entails the denial of the Russellian hypothesis, right? So surely now, if closure is okay, I can come to know through a confident deduction that the Russellian hypothesis is false, right? So now surely I can have rationally grounded knowledge of the denial of a skeptical hypothesis, indeed of a hinge commitment. How is that possible? Or conversely, if it isn't possible, doesn't that mean that I can't really have the rationally grounded knowledge of the everyday beliefs that I took myself to have? I, I think this is there's a, there's a deep issue here, and I think um, the, the way to result, I mean, I think various ways of reading Wittgenstein are, are in effect attempts to do this. So, you know, you think of Crispin Wright's work on entitlement and denying transmission principles. I think he's, it's a way of trying to square square the circle. It's a way, or think of Michael Williams's inferential contextualism. Or you think of the more radical readings of Wittgenstein, uh, Moel Chirac. I mean, she wouldn't accept this as, as a diagnosis of what she's up to, I think, but but it's one way, I think, of explaining some of the awkwardness people feel in endorsing the Wittgensteinian position and why they feel they have to bring with it a certain kind of epistemic revisionism. Now, in the book, I go through all the different ways of reading Wittgenstein. I explain you know, why they're problematic in different ways. And I'm not going to do that here because I don't have time. Rather, I'm just going to go straight for what I think is the, 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 the correct resolution to this. I think that... The real joker in the pack here has been a failure to take seriously what Wittgenstein says about the very nature of our hinge commitments. In particular, I, I want to suggest that they're not beliefs, or at least they're not beliefs. Uh, in, we, we use the blue word belief in lots of different ways right, in philosophy, and it can mean lots of different things. There's a, there's a great paper by Leslie Stevenson a few years ago uh, where he, he picks out six notions of belief that are operative in philosophical discussion, and I'm sure you probably can get more than that. Um, when epistemologists talk about belief, though, I think we have something quite specific in mind. We have some, the kind of propositional attitude which can be a constituent of, of rationally grounded knowledge. That's the kind of it's a it's a commitment to the truth of being, and it has certain basic conceptual properties. So, for example, it has the properties such that um, you, if you take yourself to have no reason whatsoever for thinking that P is true, then whatever the propositional attitude you have towards P, it's not a believing that P in this sense. It's something else. It's a wishful thinking that P or something like that, or hoping that P. It's not a believing that P. It's believing has some basic conception, conceptual connections to truth and reason. I mean, that's not to say you can't have irrational beliefs. Of course not. It's just that there's, there's like a base level uh, interrelationship between the two. And I think once you once we remember that point, and once we start looking at what Wittgenstein says about these things, you know, that they're visceral, they're not acquired in rational ways, they're not directly responsive to rational considerations, they're not optional. It's hard to see how they could be thought of as, as beliefs in this specific sense. So for, henceforth, when I talk about belief, I mean the propositional attitude, which is a constituent of rationally grounded knowledge. That's what I have in mind. Right? So if you have a different notion of belief, that's fine. I'm not saying they're not beliefs in that sense. I'm saying they're not beliefs in this sense. Notice what happens if you say that. And this is the, the core point I want to make. It's now no longer true that through closure-based inferences, one can come to acquire a belief in this sense uh, in, a hinge, in a hinge claim, right? I mean, for, for one thing, one can't acquire. I mean, look back at closure and how it's formulated. It's, it's formulated in terms of the acquisition of a belief. Right? So there's got to be a belief there, which is acquired via a paradigm case of a rational process. But yet, if Wittgenstein's right, our hinge commitments, they, they're not beliefs in the relevant sense. You know, because here we've got some a belief which can be a, a constituent of rationally grounded knowledge of the consequent. They're not beliefs in that sense. Nor are they the kinds of things that could have been acquired through rational processes, such as competent deduction. So, as it were, the thought here is not that we need to reject closure. That might be you might think that's the, the way to deal with the, the closure problem. You might think, well, Wittgenstein has to have a certain kind of epistemic revisionism in mind. I don't think he does. The problem isn't closure. The problem is trying to apply closure to all of our commitments. And effectively, I think this goes back to the point I made earlier, that really Wittgenstein, what he's opposing is the universality of rational evaluation. Once you reject that claim, then you wouldn't expect 
there to be closure inferences, which would take you from local rational evaluations to global ones, i.e. ones that take in the hinges. You know, there's got to be something suspect about that. And in fact, if you, you go back to uh, the formulations of the closure problem I offered earlier, remember that the first one had just had the bridging claim, and the second one had the, the, the closure principle in there. The second formulation of the paradox, there's no paradox at all, right? Because you can have all three. I mean, that's what, that's what I'm saying here. Closure can be right. It can be true that you've got rationally grounded knowledge of uh, the skeptical hypotheses. And uh, so it can be true you've got rationally grounded knowledge of the everyday proposition. And it can also be true that you fail to have rationally grounded knowledge of uh, denials of skeptical hypotheses. They can all be true, right? because closure is simply inapplicable. So really what's gone wrong is in the, the first formulation of that bridging claim. What you can't get is the bridging claim, because of the bridging claim, in order to get that, you don't just need closure. You need the universality of rational evaluation. And that's what Wittgenstein is rejecting. Now, this might seem to be, uh, it might seem to make hinge commitments mysterious. I actually think it's the opposite. I think the way, the way to think about hinge commitments, once we start going down this line, actually demystifies them. I think a lot of views of hinge mystify them. In particular, I think um, you know, hinge commitments, as people notice, they can look very, they can look like an heterogeneous class. You know, they vary from person to person, culture to culture, epoch to epoch. You know? So uh, think of the examples given that I've never been to the moon. Well, you know, we can imagine. Maybe my grandchildren, for example, that won't be a hinge commitment. Maybe the going to the moon is the kind of thing that happens so routinely that you know it's not a it's 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 not a certainty for you. Or you know that I speak English is a more uncertainty, uh, but obviously it's not a more uncertainty for someone living in China and so forth. But I think this superficial this this the the, the heterogeneity here is is actually superficial because if you look at it, what they all the hinge commitments share a common core. And that common core is that they're, they're codifying what I'm going to call the, the Uber hinge commitment. And this is the Uber hinge commitment to, to not being radically and fundamentally mistaken in one's beliefs. I think Wittgenstein's idea is that, that that's the basic commitment. That's the commitment that has to be in place in order for one to be a believer or a doubter in the first place, in order to enter the space of reasons. And that's a commitment that can't be rationally grounded. I mean, I think it's very plausible that you can't rationally evaluate that commitment. How would you do that? And then what we, what we, the surprising fact is that, I mean, of course, the denials of skeptical hypotheses conflict. So skeptical hypotheses conflict with the Uber hinge because, well, you know, they call all the beliefs into question on that. But what's surprising is that these everyday claims, like I've got two hands, I'm speaking English, I've never been to the moon, they conflict. Right? They're the kinds of things, if I'm wrong about that, then the Uber hinge is called question. So the philosophical discovery is that these Morian claims that they codify this uber hinge commitment. So I think once we look at it that way, there's nothing really mysterious going on here. Um, the basic certainty is to the uber hinge, but how that basic certainty manifests itself, uh, it shows itself in our commitment to a particular propositions, right? which have very quite mundane contents. We can, um, we can, if, this way of thinking about things can, uh, can explain a number of features that hinges have. I mean, I said before they're not directly responsive to rational considerations, but of course they can change over time. Once hinge commitments can change over time. I, mean, I mentioned the example just now of never having been to the moon. I mean, suppose you live long enough. Maybe you could go from having that as a hinge commitment to lacking as a hinge commitment. Moreover, interestingly, I think the way that would happen would be a rational process. I mean, the way I'm thinking about hinges is that we're which commitments codify your uber hinge commitment really depends upon your wider set of beliefs. And as that wider set of beliefs changes, you know, your beliefs about the world, about space travel and so on, well that can have an influence on which, which propositions codify the hinge. So, you know, there can be a rational process of belief change, which has as a result that one has different hinge commitments. And I think that's, that's the right way to think about it, right? They, they, they're indirectly responsive to rational considerations, but not directly. You can't, you can't rationally evaluate them directly, but you can, you know, as circumstances change, what expresses your hinge commitments can change too. You know, I think that, you know, when we think about the Uber hinge commitment too, it's very clear why that would be non-optional, why it would be visceral, why it would be animal, why it would have to lie in the background, not acquired by rational considerations, it's something presupposed in, in entering into the game of doubting, believing, and so on. And I think, you know, once we think of it these ways, it's also very clear why uh, they, these commitments aren't knowledge out beliefs. Because if they're codifying that basic, 
that basic commitment. And that basic commitment isn't the kind of thing that has the sort of conceptual connections to, to reason of truth that knowledge art beliefs have. Well, then, of course, you know, hedge commitments in general aren't going to have those features either. Um, there's a bunch of other things I could say here. Um, you know, I mean, in an ideal world, like I say, I could talk about a bunch of issues. But I mean, I think this view avoids epistemic relativism, for example. I think it also captures uh, something which I think other views about hinges don't capture, which is the sense in which um, our hinge commitments are incompatible with agnosticism about the target proposition. I think some of the problems that, that Crispin has, Crispin Wright has with his view, for example, is that he has a, no a notion there of a, of a rational trusting or what have you of a proposition. So he recognises it can't be believing in a relevant sense. But then he goes for a different kind of proposition actually, which is very unhinge-like. It's the kind of proposition actually which is compatible with agnosticism about P. That's not what our age commitments are like. They're completely incompatible with agnosticism about P. To that extent, they are like beliefs. They're just unlike beliefs in the sense that they don't have the same kind of, the right kind of conceptual connections to reason's truth of beliefs. In any case, I think you can see that once you have this view in play, it's very straightforward to see how it would apply to the sceptical problem. I mentioned earlier, you don't have to deny closure now. Closure just becomes simply inapplicable. It's also an undercutting anti-sceptical strategy. What Wittgenstein's saying is that, look, we were sort of, it's a sort of philosophical trick, as it were. The closure is not the problem. What's the problem is this universality of rational evaluation. That can look obvious, but once we inspect it, we realize it isn't obvious. It's a philosophical commitment. In fact, it's one that Wittgenstein says is completely dubious. So there's no paradox. Paradox just disappears. But notice also that this doesn't really give us much of a, a purchase on undetermination-based skepticism. I mean, if you try and apply this to undetermination-based skepticism, what would it say exactly? I mean, remember, work for Wittgenstein is, is saying that it's okay that you lack rationally graded knowledge of, of the hinge commitment. So you lack rationally graded knowledge of the denials of skeptical hypotheses. That's okay. That's compatible with closure. That's the point. But how does that help with undetermination? Because undetermination at no point says that you need to have knowledge of the denials of rational, uh, of um, radical skeptical hypotheses. I mean, all undetermination says is that you have to have this favouring support. It's entirely consistent with Wittgenstein's view uh, that well, we have this local rational support for our beliefs, our everyday beliefs, and that local support is insular. Right? There's nothing in there that, that objects to the insularity of reasons thesis. And I think if we try and bolt on a response to undetermination based skepticism from the Wittgenstein view, I think we, we just mess up the position. We're adding in things that aren't there. I think Michael Williams in his, his wonderful book on natural doubts, I think this, this is the most key mistake he makes. He doesn't keep these two skeptical problems apart. And as a result, I think he tries to extract from the hinge epistemology a way of dealing with both kinds of skeptical problems, but I, I just don't think he can. So I'm very conscious of time, so I'm going to be very uh, brief when I talk about the, the epistemological disjunctivism, which is the last thing I want to talk about. As many of you may know, I, I wrote a whole book on this topic. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to very briefly state the view. It's extremely, I mean, if you think the Wittgensteinian view is controversial, I just outlined this view is even more controversial. So basically what I'm doing is I'm taking two positions that most people think are completely controversial, and then I'm saying, actually, you should, you should endorse both of them. So just to, to maximize the, uh, the, the craziness. But, but I don't say it because, it, uh, you know, to be outlandish, I think, I think both these views are correct. And I think we put them together, we get a really powerful way of thinking about the skeptical problem. So here's the core thesis, and you get this from McDowell's work, but it's, um, you know, don't blame McDowell for anything I say, basically, because uh, there, there are certainly differences between what I want to say and what McDowell says, and there's certainly important presentational differences, actually. Here's how I put it. That in paradigm cases of perceptual knowledge, the rational support one beliefs and joys can be both factive and reflective accessible. So that, in particular, I think in paradigm cases, so this isn't a claim about knowledge in general, it's a claim about a particular kind of perceptual knowledge in paradigm epistemic conditions. And I want to claim that the rational support that one has in those cases, it's reflectively accessible in the usual kind of way, so there's no, there's no externalism going on here, uh, but that it's factored, that it entails the target proposition. And in particular, I'm thinking of factive reasons like seeing the P. That one can know the P in the perceptual case because one sees the P, and that that's fully reflectively accessible to you, and there's no hedging going on here. And we're seeing that P entails P. Now that's obviously in direct conflict with the insularity of reasons thesis, um, but I think it's right. What I try and do in that book, it's, it's a relatively short book, 
And there's a good reason for that. Is that if you're going to defend a view that everyone thinks is crazy, most epistemologists think are crazy anyway, there's no point writing a huge book because no one's going to read it. The purpose of the book was to say a few things. Say first, that this view is rooted in our ordinary way of thinking. And that's certainly true. When we, you think about how, you, how we defend our perceptual knowledge in normal conditions, you know, someone says, why do you believe that P is? Well, I don't see that P. It's just a very natural, that's, that's the natural thing to say. The second thing is that it's a view which we would want. You know, if it were available, we want it. Uh, the standard line is that one has to choose. You can have rational support that's factive, but then it can't be accessible. Or you can have rational support that's accessible, uh, but then it can't be factive. It can't, you know, this is the, the insularity of reasons thesis binding. So you can either be an externalist, or you can be an internalist, uh, uh, but then you've got insularity. The veil, of, the epistemic veil now we're talking of, of perception is for. But if you could have rational support that's factive, you have that link to the external world built into your rational support. That would clearly be highly desirable. It gives us a, a route through the internalism and externalism distinction. It gives us a distinctive handle on a problem of skepticism. So we'd want it if we could have it. And the third claim I want to make in that book is that the reasons that people give for why we, disjunctivism is incoherent are all bad reasons. So we have a view as root in our practices. We want it if we could have it. And all the reasons people are given for thinking that it's an incoherent view are bad reasons. So it's available to us. And if that works, then you get an undercutting response to radical scepticism, as we'll see, right? Because the thought is, there was nothing wrong with our ordinary epistemic practices, which had these factive reasons built into them. But through mistaken theory, we rejected something we weren't supposed to reject. Now, obviously, I can't go through all the different problems that uh, epistemological disjunctivism interface. I mean, I, I, I give you some sense of the issues here. There's what's called the access problem. I mean, it can seem as if the view entails that with a, we have a, per, a purely reflective route to empirical facts, right? Because I can reflectively access the fact of reason, and then I can know a priori that it entails the facts. So it's like a kind of McKinsey-style problem. I think that's just illusory. There's what I, I think a deeper problem, actually what I call the distinguishability problem. Um, you know, that surely if it's reflectively accessible, when you're in the good case, you know, with the undeceived case, you've got the fact of reason. If that's reflectively accessible to you, then doesn't that mean that you can know you're in the good case? Does that mean then you can know you're in the good case rather than the bad case? But then aren't good and bad cases, the deceived cases, aren't they meant to be by hypothesis indistinguishable? Um, my response to that is a bit more subtle. I go into a lot of detail about this. I think we need to make there's a distinction to be drawn here, which everyone I think should endorse, whether you're disjunctivist or not, between what I call favouring versus discriminatory epistemic support. So I think there's a sense in which, in the good case, you can know you're in the good case rather than the bad case. There is a route. But that doesn't mean that you have a way of discriminating between the good and the bad cases. As it were, a way of knowing the difference which isn't there by a way of telling the difference. And I think everyone should buy into this. I mean, I think, you know, skepticism aside, in ordinary cases, there can be ways in which I can I can know that's a zebra rather than a clover sky's mule, even though I can I would grant that I can't tell the difference between zebras and clover sky's mule. But the point is, once you apply that distinction back into disjunctivism, it gives us a way of squaring the circle here. There's a, there is a perfectly true sense, which I cannot distinguish between the good case and the bad case, and also a perfectly legitimate sense in which I can. I can know the difference, even if I can't tell the difference, to put it in a sloganizing form. Uh, another issue is a dialectical problem. You might think, oh, even if you've got the fact of reasons, can it be dialectically appropriate to appeal to them? Uh, I, I, indeed, I think you can. In fact, I think they may be the only things that are that are dialectically appropriate. So I think anything weak in the fact of reason might not be dialectically appropriate, but I'm not going to go into that. What I'm more interested in is, so so for the purposes of today, don't treat me as having defended epistemological disjunctivism, I've just thrown it out there. What I want to show you is just its import to the, the problem, because if that's true, we can reject the first claim, the undetermination based skeptical problem. We don't have to deny the undetermination principle, that's fine. We just deny the insularity of reasons thesis, so we say we can have this favoring support. We get an undercutting response. Because we can say, look, this is roots in ordinary practices. It was a philosophical error to think that this view was unavailable. But, and here's crucial, we don't get a response to closure-based skepticism. Now, in the book, funnily enough, I, did, I had a shot at, at defending closure-based skepticism in this way. And the reason I did that was because I was trying to show how the book, how the view had an uh, application to radical skepticism. And I, you know, I, I didn't want to get into all the Wittgenstein stuff. I mean, if, 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 Describing a view most people think are crazy, it's, you know, it's obviously not a good idea to bring in other crazy views in support of it. But 
Although I think you can apply epistemological disjunctivism to closure-based skepticism, it gets a kind of awkward purchase on the problem. Because what you're committed to saying, it seems like a kind of epistemic immodesty, that you have a rational basis for your belief, which is not only factive, but which from which you can infer the denials of radical skeptical hypothesis. You have a factive rational basis for denying the, the radical skeptical scenarios. And I think there's something very awkward about that. And, and this is where I think the, the bioscopic proposal comes to the fore. So let's just put this all together now. We've got a response to closure-based skepticism, the Wittgensteinian response, which doesn't give us a purchase on determination-based skepticism. And we've got a response to determination-based skepticism, which doesn't give us a purchase on, an obvious purchase on closure-based skepticism. But we've seen that these are two different problems, and that there's no inherent reason why they should have a common solution. So we could have two distinct solutions just so long as they fit together and they mutually support it and so on. And I think this is where the bioscopic proposal comes in. This gentleman here, by the way, on the, the PowerPoint, that's Linkius. Uh, I've, I've, he's, he's kind of a mascot for the view because he, Aristotle said he had this pretty natural uh, side. He could see you know, three walls and things like that. So, um, so he's my mascot. What I want to suggest is that when we put these two views together, this is exactly what we get. We, they, they look like competing positions. You know, one is about the factivity of rational support, one's about the, uh, about the locality of rational evaluation. But I think once we understand them right, they're entirely compatible. The epistemological adjunctivism isn't a view about knowledge in general, it's about a certain, the rational support a certain kind of knowledge has. Similarly, um, the Wittgensteinian view is just a view about rational evaluation. It's entirely consistent with that, whether, as we noted earlier, rational support could be both insular or it could be factor, it could be either. So they're not, they're not obviously competing, you can, they're compatible. But more than that, I think they're mutually supportive, right? Suppose we do put them together. We've now got an integrated way of dealing with both problems. So if you're a Wittgensteinian, you don't have to worry about this, this worry we had earlier that um, uh, your rational support can be both, as it were, essentially local and also insular. That, that, that sounds too skeptical for You don't have to do that at all because you've got the fact of support, which is offered to you by disjunctive. Similarly, if you're a disjunctivist, you're not committed to saying you've got rational support, which could, through a competent induction, can give you factively grounded rational knowledge of a null skeptical hypothesis, right? You can hold back from that because that's a hinge commitment. So you put the two together, they're mutually supported. They're so much stronger when you put them together. And indeed, they're both in the same spirit. They're both undercutting res responses. And I think that's, that's quite important. It makes them powerful. They're both saying that the skeptical problem is really illusory. So this is what I'm trying to do in my bioscopic treatment of skepticism. I'm trying to say that uh, what would look like two problems, one problem is in fact two problems, and that these anti-skeptical responses, which look problematic in certain ways, once you understand them right as being targeted on a particular element of the problem and put them together, they give us a very powerful unified treatment of the problem. Right, thanks very much.